Well, uh, we are in this series called I Do, and we had two goals when we started this series, and the first is this, that you and I would rediscover the beauty and joy of marriage. Life can kind of beat the joy right out of us, huh? And sometimes it's the stuff we do, and sometimes it's the stuff that's been done to us. But what if we could recapture that this is, this is about God's love and faithfulness to us? And secondly, we want to give you some practical tools, all the one talks, the devotionals, um, you know, really all the things that we can put in your hands, uh, the, the, the different um, marriage mentors that we have, uh, the marriage crisis counseling that, that we've started. And so all these practical tools to put in your hands to help you to grow. There's books in the lobby. We want to always be uh, reading together and growing together in our marriages because we think that's going to help. So if you're single, you're single again, you're married, you're, you got some challenge. I, I really believe this, that all of us have a story that we believe. And I wonder if today God wants to change that story. You might have a story in your head that says this, um, I will never be happy until I find someone who completes me. Some of you might have a story in your head that says, I can be happy or married, but not both. (laughs) Some of you have a story that you believe that says, I can never trust someone with my heart again. Others, you have a, a story in your head that says, I can never forgive myself. And I know God does, but I don't feel like he does. And so we're going to pray today that God meets with us. And so would you join me? Heavenly Father, we come before you right now in this moment. I ask for your help. I cannot, in my own power and strength and all the words that would come out of my mouth, do what you want to do today without your spirit and without your power. Holy Spirit, would you teach us, open our hearts to what you have to say and guide our lives, strengthen our relationships, and renew our joy. We pray this in Christ's name, and everybody said, amen. Um, I brought up the word covenant. Did you notice that? brought the word covenant, which, you know, it's really kind of like, it's not really a word we use a ton, right? If somebody says, I want to make a covenant with you, you're thinking, do I have to get a tattoo? I already have a tattoo. Do I get another tattoo? I mean, what's going on here? And so um, the word covenant is actually, um, it, 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 we tend to think in our relationship about promises and contracts, but God thinks about covenants. And, and see, contracts are, are, I get why we have them, because they protect our heart, don't they? And so I, we have this contract, and a lot of times we don't have it written. I don't like write one up and go, sign here, sign here. But we have them in our hearts and in our minds. And if you do this, I'll do this, but if you don't, then I'm out, and I won't. But God has a covenant, and his covenants are based on who he is, I do and I will. I will redeem you. I will rescue you. I will, uh, you will be my people. I will be your God. I will lead you into the land I promise you. These are the covenant relationship that God has when he says, I do and I will. And when we have wedding ceremonies, do you get what it's about? It's a covenant, and all of it's to reflect the pledge that God's made to us. It's the reason why that often in the pledge you face forward and the vows you face each other. Because the pledge is a response that you say to God. I do and I will. And the vows are what you make to each other. And God has made covenants with people. And I want you to understand this because some of us, you know, we, we got in a relationship where we felt like we kept our end of the bargain, but someone else didn't. And so now what do we do? And I want to point you to Jesus. I want to point you to the Father that you have in heaven. I want to point you to the Holy Spirit that wants to help you, the comforter, that, 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 that indwelling power of God. Because, you see, um, in covenants, God made covenants with people and often like every time they didn't keep their end of the bargain. Made a covenant with Adam and Eve, and then they rebelled, and did he give up on them? He made a covenant with Noah, like saves them through the flood, his entire family, and says never again will the world end in a flood. And, and, and actually, he actually gives them the sign of a rainbow. And what does Noah do? He worships God, and then he gets drunk. We don't teach that one to the kids, do we? <laughs> this week, we're going to talk about how Noah got no. We skipped that part. (laughs) Abraham made a covenant. You'd be a father of many nations. And he ended up having a child with his wife's maidservant. Makes a covenant with David. Your kingdom will never end. And what happens? David commits adultery and arranges for her husband to be left for dead in a battle. Makes a covenant with Israel. And they turn their backs on him. Makes a covenant with Moses. Loses a temper and never enters his promised land. Like, what if we decide we're only making covenants with people who never break them? I want to let you know that the gospel message is this, is that God's faithfulness is greater than our unfaithfulness. 
The power of the gospel is this, that when your story meets God's story, you have a better story. In my mind, better story is this. Nobody ever hurts me. Everyone keeps their end of the bargain with me. And God's got grace for me because, come on, it's, I'm Wes. Have we met? <laughs> Covenant is the relationship that God gives to us. And all of this even was prophesied about in Jeremiah chapter 31. It's coming on the screen. That there's, there, there's a new covenant coming. Something that's deeper. Something that's stronger. Something that's more durable. It says in Jeremiah 31, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. The covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves her wife, his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. New covenant. You open a Bible, you have an Old Testament and a New Testament. Simply a translation from Jerome in the 5th century where he takes the word covenant and transmit, translates it for the Latin word that we now have, testament. There's an old covenant and there's a new covenant. And all the old covenants point to the new covenant that one day God says, I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to win your heart. I wonder if this new covenant in Jeremiah is what Jesus had in mind as he was there on that last supper and with his closest friends on the night he was betrayed, on the night that he would be crucified, on the, uh, the, the night before he was crucified. As he's there at that last supper, he says, this cup is the new covenant of my blood for the forgiveness of all your sins. You see, our relationships as followers of Jesus is very different than our culture's relationships because those relationships aren't that durable because they're based on how well we can keep what we said. But our relationships are built on the covenant of Christ Jesus that by his blood we're forgiven. And it adds so much security and strength to our relationships. And God wants to give you that joy and that security today. I was after the first gathering of uh, two weeks ago. I was walking out there and in the lobby, a couple came up to me and a woman, she said to me, somebody I've known for years, her marriage went through a difficult season a season of separation where they did not know if it was going to make it after some truth came out that had been buried into the heart of her husband for so many years. And they walked through that difficult season, and she said these words to me, you don't know if you have a covenant until you need it. Do you have a contract or covenant? Are you a single person? Are you looking for contract or covenant? covenant requires faith you have to believe God is who he says he is he's going to do what he says he's going to do that the risk I take is this that God will take care of me that my heart is okay in the hands of God Abraham had to trust God that God would be his provider we talked last week about how the different warning lights on the dashboard of our life go off of worry and coveting and wanting things that we don't have and feeling like we have to buy them. We go into debt and then we feel bad about ourselves and self-pity. And all these warning lights are simply this, God saying to us, trust me to be your provider. And it's there at that place that Abraham learns that God is his provider. And he even names the place. He says, this is Jehovah Jireh. God, the Lord is my provider for better or for worse for richer or for poor, and today in sickness and in health. If you're taking notes, our big idea coming on the screen is this right here. God commits to take care of you when you're sick. And we're going to talk about in sickness and in health. But first, let me ask this question. How are you when you get sick? Are you one of those that's like, leave me alone? Or are you one of those who's like, I need you? Who's I need you? Who's I need you? Who's I need you? I'm an I need you, right? Who's leave me alone? All right, and who's just, yeah, whatever. <laughs> whatever. I'm just like, I get sick. I'm kind of like, can we all just have a moment? Let's alert the entire church. <laughs> Wes has a cold. Some of you have not been interceding in prayer and fasting. Some of you probably aren't even tithing. It's the reason why I have a cold. I'm not judging you. 
just speaking truth. Um, the, the promise of Scripture is this, that God, God promises, God vows, God commits to take care of us when we're sick. Have you thought about that? Psalm chapter 41, I told you about, I've been thinking about the scripture all week, and it's talking about those who care for the needy and those who care for the weak. God says, I'm going to take care of you. It says, the Lord nurses them when they're sick, and he restores them to health. You ever thought about God, not just the great physician, but the great nurse? There's some powerful things that happen when, when, when we're sick. Now, let me just say that God's plan wasn't that this world would be filled with sickness and disease and death. But rather, that's a sign to us that something is off. But in the midst of all of this, God is deeply at work. Some of us might say, well, why doesn't God rid the entire world of sickness? But know this, God's plan was never that we would live a little bit longer with a little bit less pain, but that you might live forever. It's a promise. Revelation 21, all things are made new. No sickness, no dying, no death, no pain, no more sorrow, no tears. The Apostle Paul says there's so many powerful things that happened in his life that he learned about who God was, not so much in his strength, but in his weakness. He said it was there that he heard God say, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Do you believe that? I love to read history, and there's a book by a sociologist named Rodney Stark called The Rise of Christianity. And it studies how in the world did we go from 12 disciples and 120 in an upper room to like, like it's like becomes bigger than the Roman king, than the Roman empire. And now you have Christianity, this message of the gospel spread all over the world. And so he studies it as a sociologist. And one of the things he talks about as a factor, you might find this interesting. One of the factors is how the followers of Jesus cared for those who were sick when plagues came. That when a plague came into the Roman Empire, those who had wealth and could would run for the hills. I'm out of here. I, how, what's our attitude when things come into our life of sickness or unhealth? Do we just like, I'm out of here. People would just run to the hills. Do you know what the followers of Jesus did? When people were running away, they ran to those who were sick. Because they had a different perspective of life. They had such a different perspective because they had this perspective of eternity and resurrection that, like, it changes how you see a world where there's sickness. And so they ran, too, and cared for those who were sick. And here's some of the things that happened. Like, okay, sometimes those who were sick died, but they did not die alone. They saw, people saw followers of Jesus showing compassion and caring and giving comfort to those who were sick. It was powerful. Um, sometimes those who are the followers of Jesus, the caretakers, sometimes the caretakers got sick and they died, which people saw that courage and they were amazed and they were drawn to it. And sometimes, sometimes the people got better. How many of them do you think became followers of Jesus? Like all of them? You ever wonder where modern day hospitals started? Was it, was it followers of Jesus taking Jesus at his word when he said, whatever you've done to the least? When I was sick, you cared for me. Some of us are having those opportunities right now as a caretaker to care for someone who is sick and live out those vows. It's powerful. In sickness and in health. Now, let me, I should at least start off with this. I should at least say that we should aim for health. Like when you're saying your vows, you know, when you're like, you're there, you know, and, and there's this, in sickness and in health, I'm like sitting there going, Terry said it, so that means this, I can get as unhealthy as I want, and she's stuck. <laughs> I could use a Big Mac, right? I'm loving it. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. <laughs> right? She said it. No, listen, part of saying this covenant with each other is this. We're also committing to help each other be healthier. Can I just ask a question? Are you, are you guys, in your relationships with those you love the most, do you help each other be healthier or more unhealthy? How are we doing with that? When you go on a mission trip, there's rules, okay? I don't know if you've been on one. And whether they're spoken or unspoken, there's these different rules. And so some of the rules are like this, okay? Everybody eats. Everybody drinks water. Everybody sleeps. And everybody's going to exercise. 
That's just rules, okay? Because we don't want on a mission trip people getting sick or caring for everybody's sick or sickness spreading. Now, with the water, though, you have to be careful, don't you? Because it's got to be clean water, often bottled water. But you can hear all over the place, the team, what's the one of the common things? On the team, all the time, you're saying, let's pray, and did you hydrate? Did you hydrate? Have you hydrated? Are you hydrating? It's just so important. And then, like, you care about, like, like not just the food you eat, but how it's prepared. You're like, I don't know about that. Isn't it interesting how, like, you're so picky overseas because you're like, I just, this, my body's my temple. I cannot be bringing of the Holy Spirit into, I can't. You walk everywhere on a mission trip. You're like, how are we getting there? We're going to walk. Again? Yeah. What if, what, if, what if we did that? I shared some of you guys before. When I first got married, I, my, my wife said to me, she goes, honey, you want to go on a walk? And I said, where? And she's like, nowhere. We're just going to walk. And I'm thinking, but I, I got a driver's license, so I didn't have to do that. <laughs> We're just walking. I don't know. Are we done with the walking? Can someone pick us up? I feel like I'm living out the children of Israel right here. <laughs> Quail, please come. I'm getting hungry. Let's walk to McDonald's. I mean, you know what I'm saying? But there's something about when, when we exercise together. Can I just encourage you? Would you even have that conversation and just say to the person you love the most, what do you want to do so we can be healthier together? So it might just be going walks. It might even help your relationship. Everybody eats. Everybody drinks. Water. Everyone, everyone sleeps. Oh, on a mission trip, you're like, okay, no. Way too important that I'm at full strength. i got to be at full strength because this is really important. What if, what, what if we live that way? Do you know your body needs a rest? God knows that. In sickness and in health. Now, no matter how healthy you try to be, sometimes you get sick. And when we get sick, how do we care for each other? And I would like to suggest today that the way we care for each other is the way God cares for us. You're like, how does God care for us? I'm glad you asked. The first thing I wrote down is this, is that God sees you when you're sick. One of the hardest things to do when you're sick is to be sick and to feel like nobody notices. But God sees us. There's a scripture in Psalm 56 that says this, you kept, you kept track, you keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. God sees, in fact, nothing in all creation is hidden from his sight. So God sees when we're sick. God sees when we're down. The first time I remember really kind of getting sick, I was um, maybe like kindergarten or something like that, first grade. And I was at the skating rink, ice skating rink in South Tacoma and uh, Lakewood area. And so I, I'm there at the skating rink and I'm like, I, I could, something was off. I wasn't feeling right. And so I just decided I need to back out of this ice skating bit. And I went and sat down on a bench and, and, and ate my red rope. Those are good for you. <laughs> and uh, my sisters were all ice skating, and then we went home. And my, my mom, when I got home, she noticed I just was down. And she looked at my skin, and I had red dots. She said, oh. And I ended up having chicken pox. And I was out. Not like I missed one day of school or two days of school. I, like, missed, like, more than a week. I was gone so long that they did this thing where my entire class made a get well soon cards to me. And I even got one from this girl I had a crush on, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I wonder, what would it look like in our church if somebody's gone long enough? I'm not saying one week. Come on, like, come on, come on. But like you miss a few weeks, people start to miss you. And they're like, let's just like at the end of our gatherings today, we're writing get well cards to everybody. Also, my dad had one of his coworkers that knew I was sick for a long period of time, and he wanted to give me a gift to cheer me up, so he gave me his baseball cards. That almost made it worth it. <laughs> wow. That showed a lot of care and concern. And third, the third thing I remember from this is that my mom cared for me while I was sick in such a way that it created a special bond. There's something that happens really special when someone loves you enough to care for you when you're sick. Did you know that God cares for you when you're sick? And there's a special bond that's created that you know that God loves you not just when you're healthy and well, but he loves you when you're sick. 
you're just gonna, you're gonna get better. Second thing I wrote down is this God listens to your cries. Anybody here make sounds when you're sick? I, I'm a sound maker. Oh, I don't feel well. Oh. And I, I actually call it righteous whining. <laughs> but my wife doesn't. I just want to make sure she notices so she can use her gift of, like, compassion. In Psalm 22, it says, For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but listened to their cries for help. Do you know one of the beautiful things that happens when we're sick is we learn to pray. It's funny. We can pray anytime. It's funny, do you pray more when you're sick? Like, you know, I'm, like, walking around healthy. I'm like, God, I got this. Now I'm sick. I'm like, God, I need you. Maybe we need them that much all the time. Do you pray for others more when they're sick? God, thank you for this food. And we remember so-and-so, they're sick, and help them get better. We could pray for each other a lot of times, couldn't we? Uh, there's a dear woman in our church who's gone on to be with the Lord, who facing cancer, our elder team came around and we prayed for her. And did what James 5 says, call for the elders of the church to pray for, anoint them with oil, symbol of the Holy Spirit. And we prayed for her. And at the end of that prayer, she said something to me very powerful. I'll never forget. She said to me these words, Wes, perhaps I became sick that we might have this opportunity to pray. Sickness is a reminder of how much we need God when we're well. We cry to him. Third thing is God comforts you in your afflictions. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. Uh, One of my favorite Beatitudes says this, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God knows how to bring comfort to you. Uh, Recently, there's a new lifer who just passed away in her memorials today. And it happened so quickly, some of you know her. She asked for Peter Blue to come out and sing some worship songs and to pray over her. And by the time we got there, in just a few short days, she was not, we weren't sure she was lucid. I don't know if she caught all of this, but we were there. The family was there. Perhaps she did. And Peter takes out his guitar. And if you were here last week, you saw Peter Blue. He leads our North Kitsap campus. And he began to sing, How Great Is Our God and How Great Thou Art. And the presence and comfort of God fills that room. And Peter then began to pray over her. And then he said, amen, and he kissed her on the forehead. And I thought, that's what Christian love looks like. Wow. Jesus told a story about a good Samaritan. How could a Samaritan be good? When someone was beaten and left for dead on the road, and people passed by, they just didn't even notice, didn't see them, didn't hear their cries, just kept walking by. I mean, they saw him, but didn't stop. (laughs) Didn't really see him. A Samaritan stopped. The natural enemy of this person stopped. He saw him, went over to him. What did he do? He soothed his wounds. What do I do when somebody's sick? Soothe their wounds. Because why? When you're sick and you're hurt, you have a God who soothes your wounds too. The last thing I wrote is this. God rescues you from your despair. So easy to go into this downward spiral of despair when you're sick. But God rescues us from that. In Psalm 34, the righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. Paul said, we're pressed, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. I was talking with a new lifer who was sick and chronically sick, and he said, am I going to get better? What do you say to that? They're chronically sick. They're looking at me. Wes, am I going to get better? Do I say, hate to tell you the truth, but no. No one wants that person praying for them, right? They're like, can you send Peter Blue? (laughs) Don't send Wes. And I'm like, I'll sing. No, don't send Wes. Really don't send Wes. Send Peter, please. Am I going to get better? Do you say yeah when they're chronically sick and you don't know? If the Lord wills. Or perhaps it's different when you believe the gospel. That what God has for us is life forever with him. That we can look each other in the face in sickness and say, are you going to get better? Yeah, a lot better. We have a God who cares for us in our sickness. He will not leave us or abandon us. How do I know? Look at the tomb. It's empty. And the question I end with today is this. Who is it that God wants you to care for in this season? 
And maybe you need someone to care for you. Is there somebody that maybe you need to write a get wealth card to, maybe put some baseball cards in there, that you've just noticed they could use some comforting, some love, some compassion? I'm going to ask the band to come, and we're going to say a prayer together. Would you go ahead and stand with me? And I just wonder, how many of you here today know somebody who's sick that could use some prayer? Go ahead and raise your hand. You know their name. I'm looking all over, all over in the front here, up in the bleachers there. Okay. Okay. We're going to say a prayer. I want you to pray for them where you're standing by name. You say their name to God and you pray for them. And I'm wondering if you're here today and what you need is this. You need to be encouraged with the message of the gospel. That it isn't just praying for somebody who's sick, but honestly, you're distant from God right now. In some ways, the, the sickness has reached your soul. And in this moment is a time for you to know that you have a Father in heaven who is not mad at you, but mad for you, running to you, loving you, wants to care for you, forgive you, and welcome you into his arms. And if you would like to come back to Christ or say yes to Christ, this is the moment for us as we pray. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, as we come before you, in this moment, we sense your presence and we thank you for your great love and your grace and your, 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 your love endures forever, your faithfulness through all eternity. God, we've fallen short. We have brokenness. We're ashamed. And in the midst of all of this, you never stop loving us. And in our broken condition, we come to you and you say, I will care for you. Jesus, you are the good Samaritan who stops and heals, cares and soothes our wounds and paid the price for our health. And in this moment right now, you are caring for us. Jesus is caring for you. If you need God's love and faithfulness and forgiveness in your heart where you're standing, say, God, that's me. That's me. And right now, God, we lift up those we love by name to you who need prayer. They're sick, and they need to feel your comfort and feel your presence and be encouraged in their despair. Those who are caretakers need to feel the power of the Holy Spirit, giving them strength to continue to care. By name, we lift up these people in Jesus' name. Strengthen them. Let them know, God, you're there. You care. You will not leave us. You are our healer. We put all of our trust in you. We need to feel your presence, God. We're here right now, and we need you. We pray this in Christ's name.